suffered an embarrassing blowout defeat that has again raised lots of questions about the team and Phil Neville. Hello everybody and welcome back to Miami Total Football Radio. As you know it, Miami Total Football Radio. The number one podcast on all things Inter-Miami, providing you all the latest news, updates, inside information, analysis, opinions, analysis, excuse me, opinions, and more. My name is Franco Penizo. I am one-third of the hosting team. The other two-thirds are also present here, but the other two-thirds are also football manager nerds. That's the word I'm going to use because they have been talking about it nonstop since last week, since Jose Armando joined in on the Steve Brenner fun in Football Manager, and they have not stopped. Literally have not stopped. We have a WhatsApp group for Miami Total Football Radio, and it's been 90% about Football Manager. So Which I will... St- jealous. <laughs> jealousy. Jealousy is horrible. Straight away. Hey, look. No, Steve is doing such a good job of promoting that game, which I still think he's covertly uh, a spokesman for, that I almost joined in on getting it and playing it, but I was like, no, it's too elaborate. I just don't have the time, especially starting my new job at the Sun Sentinel, which I began officially this week. So I, I don't want to dive into it and get and get uh, and fall into that rabbit hole. But you've heard Steve Brenner's voice, and Primo is here. Primo, how are you doing? And please give us an update on your football manager because we know you're going to do it anyway. I'm good, man. I'm good. I'm good. I mean, uh, yeah, it's just you know, you're just jealous. You're not in our club, and that's fine. So just deal with it. You know, you just have you just have to deal with it. Uh, everything is good. Dortmund second in the Bundesliga. I just won in the Champions League. It's Dynamo Kiev, having lost to Cologne in the previous match. Absolutely battered them. Had all the shots, everything. Missed the missed the penalty, and then they score with my keeper mucked up in the eight second minutes. So it's just. It's the roller coaster life of, of management, which I'm sure we're gonna we're gonna talk about because uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's it can go up and down, and you just never know what's gonna happen next. Wait, so did you win the Champions League final, or that was just a, uh, a no, no, game? no, this no, this is one of the uh, qualify uh, one of the quali- uh, qualifying games, yeah. So, um, oh, qualifying uh, to get into Champions League, or you? No, talking- no, no, no. Sorry, the main the main stage of the Champions League, yeah, but the the, the group stage, the group stage. Okay. They'll just beat Dynamo Kiev one 0 and now um, yeah, Jude Bellingham is fantastic for me right now. And um, yeah, it's it is detailed. And if anyone wants to get involved in it, 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 it <laughs> there he goes again. There he goes again. <laughs> well, just, you... yeah, the, the detail it goes into is quite is something else, really. So, but and it's not. I don't see you making it as if I'm sitting here for hours playing it. I'm just dabbling with it now and then. But I um, haven't had the whole time to sit there for like twelve hours and play it, which I really want to, but I can't. So there you go. The the other day in the WhatsApp chat that we have, I forgot what we were talking about, and El Primo sent us a screenshot of his desktop or excuse me his laptop while he was playing it anyway jose cinco armando also known as i like to call him sometimes island jose which we can get into later and by the way that shirt you wore last friday at the miami fc event fit you perfectly fit that nickname perfectly jose (laughs) Jose, how are you doing and how is your football manager campaign going because i know you have uh officially dived in headfirst uh, I'm doing good, and yeah, but I'm I'm just getting started, so I'm just getting used to. Well, first I want to fit the time into the schedule to just be able to play and concentrate and and do what I need to do. But I'm managing Inter Miami, so you know, so far, well, I guess it's not going bad because I'm still in preseason. I I, I ended up losing my first game against Inter Miami too, which wasn't good. <laughs> but you know, um, it, it's preseason, so I, I might not win the Carolina Challenge Cup, but I think I'll be fine for the regular season. Well, I was going to ask you to tell the people who you decided to pick because initially you were going to get Motawa, yes or yes, but you couldn't find them, and you ended up going with uh, with Inter Miami. So, so you know that, that's pretty cool, and and you can provide updates as I'm sure you will over the coming weeks and months because. I'm sure some listeners will care to hear about how you did with Inter Miami. More so than Steve's Dortmund, which, you know, it's it's enjoyable, but it's it's Dortmund. You know, it's it's one of the top teams in the world. So uh, not not as interesting, in my opinion. Well, yeah, but I just um, I just want to play. I just want to deal with good players. You know, I just want to deal with good players. Oof. I haven't got the patience maybe to go lower down right now. But you want to deal with good players. Wow, right. just took a whole shot at all of Inter Miami. Wow, nice, nice one. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we are going to talk about Inter Miami and obviously their big, big loss that they suffered this past Sunday on the road to Austin FC. We're going to touch on that game and analyze it as we normally do. We're going to preview this weekend's upcoming game against LAFC with another 
guest, and we're going to touch on a bunch of other topics, including including the appearance of a Honduran at Inter Miami training training in Maynard Figueroa. Also have some stadium minor stadium update, and again, a lot to talk about, a lot to jump into and dissect. So, guys, let's get to it. Okay, guys, so as I mentioned there in the intro segment, Inter-Miami suffered its first loss of the 2022 campaign this past Sunday on the road to Austin FC, and the team did so via a 5-1 defeat. Yes, you heard that correctly, a 5-1 defeat. One of those lopsided routes, those losses that leave a very bitter taste in your mouth, um, we had seen a lot of in 2021 that I thought by and large would be something of the past, but already in week two, you see a very familiar type of scoreline and type of unfolding in terms of how the game went. So let's just quickly go into the lineup for Inter Miami. There were no real surprises. Well, no, I'm going to take that back. There definitely were some surprises. So Clement Diop in goal and your back five from right to left were DeAndre Yedlin. Christopher McVeigh, Jairo Quinteros as the sweeper, Breck Shea as the surprise inclusion as the left center back, and Noah Allen got the start at left fullback. Damian Lowe did not travel out due to the groin injury picked up in week one. Your midfield trio, again, from right to left were Gene Mota, Gregory the captain, and Mo Adams, and up top, you had Ariel Lasseter replacing Leonardo Campana in the lineup, and Gonzalo Higuain. That was Inter Miami starting lineup. Breck Shea was a big talking point before kickoff because he's not a normal center back and, and Phil Neville went with that look. I don't think he had a particularly great game, but we'll, we'll d- jump into all of that in, in a moment. Let's start with the biggest takeaway. And I'm going to start with mine so that we can just get into it right away. I wrote this and I will obviously say it here on the podcast as well. I think Phil Neville made a lot of mistakes in this game. And I put the loss more on him than on anybody else or any specific player or any players. I know after the game, Phil Neville said the players didn't follow the game plan, which again, we'll dive into. But for me, this one's on Phil Neville because practically nobody, maybe saving Robert Taylor, who came in uh, off the bench at halftime, maybe Leonardo Campana because he scored a goal, and maybe, maybe DeAndre Yetlin. Save those three guys, and two of them were substitutes, practically nobody had a good game. Practically nobody. And if when that many players have a bad game, I have to put that on the coach. I can't just say, oh, well, you, you know, the players let him down. But that's my opinion. That's just my analysis. I rewatched the game, of course, and I took away a lot of the same, the same uh, impressions that I had on initial watch. Did take away something a bit differently, but again, we'll get into that in a second. Steve, as... The resident defender of Phil Neville on this podcast, I playfully call you his lawyer. What were your thoughts on the game on Sunday? And do you agree with me that Phil shoulders most of the blame for this? Look, it's a bad, bad day at the office. I think they didn't didn't play very well. They, you know, it's just the same old story, wasn't it? Didn't really, couldn't really create much. Blown away way too early on. Austin were were great at home. Um, the defense, which we thought looked decent. In the, the first game, you know, wasn't great. You know, like McVeigh was really good against Chicago. He wasn't very good the other night. Um, yeah, I think everyone everyone shoulders the blame. The manager, and the coach. I mean, everyone. It was a it was they got they got hammered. Um, you know, when they would have gone there and thought they would have had a chance of getting something from the game, um, and they didn't perform. So, but it just shows that they've got a you know a defense that it, although it looked good the other night, it's still one of the cheapest. Um, defenses in in the league probably, and that's because of the sanction and everything like that. So a reality check maybe. Maybe we got a little bit too excited or giddy a little bit after the the, the draw the other night. We're lording a lot of praise on them, and then you know, then you see what happens on sort of Saturday Sunday, and you you realise that everything that the club has gone through to get to this point. So let's see if they get a reaction on Saturday. So you don't agree that Phil Neville shoulders most of the blame? You think it's just evenly distributed throughout the team? I think so. I mean, it's, 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 football, it's football, isn't it? I mean, every, you know, there's, there's the, yeah, there it is. There it is. Commission, commission the manager, is going up. The manager there it probably is. got some. 
And the, hold on, the manager probably got some stuff wrong, which I'm sure he would he would readily admit in terms of selection or what tactics or whatever. And then the players also didn't perform. So yeah, yeah, of course the manager shoulders the blame. He's the manager. That's what he gets paid for. But well, if you're going to try and analyse it as well, I mean, he can't say it's his fault totally that none of them performed. I mean, some of it's on them as well, isn't it? And you know, it's a new it's a new team. It's a new team, and they maybe you know they haven't. This was the first big game which they found themselves behind in. And they, and they buckled. Do you know what I mean? So it, it happens. It's not, not totally on Phil Neville, but it is mostly on Phil Neville. The because the ga- because the game plan was terrible. And I'm going to switch to Jose here because I know Jose had this very big concern going into the game. And we talked about it, I think, on the show last week. And then we talked about it, him and I. We spoke in person on Friday at the Miami FC jersey unveiling, not into Miami, the Miami FC jersey unveiling, about how predictable the game plan was going to be because if Inter Miami, as we we had expected, just going off the interviews and going off the matchup and going off the situation, they were going to counterattack. Okay, no problem with that, no issue with that. But they only had they came out in a five three two and they only had Ariel Lasseter out there. He's essentially the only target that is capable of running in behind that defense and stretching that back line. Iguain doesn't have that in his in his wheelhouse. So guess what? Only one player that those center backs are going to find in behind. And guess what Austin FC's center backs did? They already knew that. They expected that. And all they had to do was take a few steps behind every time they saw uh, inner Miami center back wind up and take a couple steps back and the ball would come and they would just bring it down and Austin FC would quickly, quickly recover the ball and start another attacking sequence the other way. The game plan was awful. Terrible. It did not work. It was predictable. Not once. Not once in that first half. And you can go back, look at the highlights, you can go back and watch the game. Not once did Ariel Lasseter get in behind. Not once. Because Austin FC knew exactly what Intermind was going to do. Jose, what were your thoughts on the game in general? And do you agree with me that Phil shoulders a lot of the responsibility for this one? And I, before you answer, I want to say this. I, I, did, I do feel bad for Phil Neville on some level. Because I know he's trying his hardest. We talk to him on a weekly basis. You know, I, I know he's putting his blood, sweat, and tears into it and trying to make this team a winner. But he, he definitely got it wrong on Sunday, in my opinion. Jose, do you share that? Do you share that viewpoint? Yeah, I do agree with you. And um, you know, when you're playing the counterattack game, you, you rely on playing good, good uh, at, a, at a high level defensively. And um, when you put in Break Shea as a center back, then you compromise that because he's not a center back. So you know, when you're playing with five players, uh, uh, f- a five man back line. Um, it's not going to work just because you play five guys and and let them know that they have to defend. You know, they have to be good players. They have to know how to play the position. And um, and I think including with, with you including Brick Shea as a center back, you compromise that ability that the team had last year. So it's not going to magically work. You know, it, it takes a lot of hours. It takes a lot of a compromise from players to have a good performance defensively. And then when you play the counterattack game and it becomes so predictable, like Inter Miami has been lately, um, you know, it, it, it really helps. It really helps the opponent. And I think that's exactly what happened this week. Um, I, I would say as well that, you know, if, if you take a chance on the team offensively and you play with four in the back, and put one more player in the middle of the field, you might still be able to defend or hold on to possession a little bit more. I think the one thing that that Inter Miami was missing over the weekend in their setup defensively is that they couldn't defend with the ball. They were not able to hold on to the ball in the middle. You you never saw um, either Gregory, Mo Adams, or, or, or Mota just, just be able to recover the ball and hold on to it, you know? Give the defenders a bit. That never happened, and and we talked about that in in the in the pregame we did a, on on Twitter, um, you know, and that never happened. And so that's why that's why it's it's a struggle for Inter Miami when that happens, and it will be throughout the year when that happens. Now I'm going to say one thing, and and I don't know if I'm getting ahead here, but um, I will give credit to Phil, and I think it's a good sign moving forward. If you want to look at a positive for me in this game. This is the one thing that I liked. And it's that feel he was able to uh, adjust tactically in half time. Was it too late? Yes, it was very late. A- and that will not take the blame out, uh, at least on, on his side. But I give him a lot of credit. And it is hopeful to me that he's in control of this team because last year, 
there were several times, several times, and I think you both will agree with me on this. There were several times in which we thought it's time to get rid to get rid of the back five line. It's time. They need to win this game. They need to attack this team. And he never was comfortable enough to do it. During the weekend, it happened at halftime. So if you want to look at a positive, there you go. That's it. My analysis of the second half isn't the same as yours. I, I do like that he switched out of the back five and, and tried to get a more more attacking numbers in there. But Austin FC scored really quickly into the second half, made it 3-0. And then from there, when Inter Miami had its best moments for a 10 to 12 minute spell, the game was practically out of reach and Austin had, had took, taken their foot off the accelerator. Really quickly, Jose, what do you think that says about Ayame Mabika? That the fact that Phil Neville went with Breck Shea, who is not a natural center back, I believe early, early, early on in his career, when he was about to turn pro or just turning pro, I, th- I think he played some center back early on. Maybe throughout his career, sporadically, he's filled in there, but he hasn't played that position in years. Certainly not since he's been with Inter Miami. So it's been years since he's played there. I thought it was definitely concerning before the game and I you know I tweeted it out it's either going to be a stroke of genius from Phil Neville if it works or it's going to be uh, a subject or a topic of, of a lot of criticism because Breck Shea's not a center back so what can you expect from somebody that's not a center back in that spot and, and Breck Shea did not have a good game uh he was uh he was, at, you know, he he didn't provide coverage for Noah Allen on the first goal, not not sufficient enough coverage because he doesn't come and help try to help close down the dribbler. He actually falls back and, and tries to fall in towards the middle, and, and then on the second one he leaves the 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 mark on side by by just not not being in line with the rest of the defense, which is why is why you normally go with a center back group that plays the position and that has maybe more time together. Now, obviously. Damian Lowe not playing was a big blow for them. But even more so then, why you need, I think, you need someone that's a natural center back. Because the defense moves often in in synchronized ways. You even saw it last year during uh, pregame warm-ups. You know, the Inter-Miami would have the back five. I know Phil Neville after the game called it a back three, but... we we continue to insist it's a back five. That's just our our point, or at least Jose and I's. And you see that back five, they would do a drill before every game where they move together. Uh, one of the trainers, one of the coaches would, would hold the ball and, and he would he would have them move back and forth um, in a short space just to get the move, excuse me, the movements synchronized. And Breck Shea obviously wasn't on the same page because he ha- he's not a center back. He hasn't gotten a lot of repetition there. Phil Neville said after, after the game was about providing experience and continuity. But to me, that says quite a bit if you're prioritizing Breck Shea, who's not a natural center back, and who I can't blame for having a bad game because it's not his natural position, uh, right. over someone like I met Mabika. So, you know, I, I think that raises an eyebrow as to as to how highly I met Mabika is rated currently. Uh, I will add this just because for context sake, and I forgot to mention this on last week's pod, which I was kicking myself about afterwards. Inter-Miami 2 played a friendly against Miami FC two Sundays ago. So the day after the season opener against the Chicago Fire. I mean, Mabika was part of the team, from what I heard, as was Ariel Lasseter, George Acosta, etc. Miami FC won that game 3-1, to one, and from what I heard, I mean, Mabika did not have a very good game. So I don't know if that was a big part in, in Phil's, Phil Noble's decision for not going with I mean, Mabika or, um, over Breck Shea, but it, it is information that I have that I will pass along because it, it may, maybe does provide context. Maybe that's something that, that played a big part in Phil Neville making the decision of Breck Shea over Mabika. Jose, did you have anything you want to add there or can we continue on to, yeah. to the next topic? Okay. No, I, I would say one thing. You know, To me, it's concerning that the team is not ready um, for Damian Lowe to be out. That is the one thing that is concerning to me. It's not concerning, and I don't, I don't think that's the right word when it comes to Mabika. Because, you know, uh, you know, he's a young player. I mean, we're talking two two games at the professional level for him, and a preseason that was not very good. So there's plenty of time for him to develop. I don't know if he's gonna become a great defender. It doesn't look like it. But you know, we we have to give him the benefit of the doubt. And so to me, it's not concerning right now personally for him in terms of the future of him in, in Inter Miami. But it is concerning that the team is not ready for Damian Lowe to be out and they have to start to improvise. So, because that makes you think, so what happens if for some reason Quinteros is not available for this weekend 
and Damian Lowe is not available. So what's 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 going on there? Are we going to have Gregory playing as a center back because Mabika's not ready, Sailor's not ready? Well, what will happen then? So that's the one thing that I that I uh, I wouldn't put all the blame on 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 Mabika. You know, it's it's. I'm not, I'm not putting blame on him. I'm, not, I'm just. Adding the context that, from what I heard, he had, he did not have a good game, and that could be part of the reason why Phil Neville did not decide to go with him from the start in this one, or or play him in this one. I think we can all agree that expectations were a little bit higher on Mavika, right? I, I mean, don't, I don't, I don't well, know what expectations expect- are, but I would think that a, a natural a center back would play over over someone that's not a natural yeah, center back. That's right. what that's what yeah. I would think. But that, that was the decision he made, though, and he thought, you know... And it didn't ex- work, yeah, but it didn't work, so... I've got the experience. Yeah, okay, it didn't work, so the next time we'll think, well, actually, no, it didn't work last time, maybe I'll try and beat him, and let's, let's see what see how it goes, but that's... You make the decisions, and sometimes they, they go right, sometimes it's wrong, that was a wrong... He'll look at that and think, well, that was probably not the, great, the best decision, maybe I shouldn't put him in, yeah, sure, whatever. Um, that, that's what happens, yeah. So, 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 the reg- so the regular season is a time to do experimental things to see what what's no, what, ex- what works best and what doesn't work best. Like, experimental like, things, but I, I mean, you've got your, your best centre back, Jose is right. He is worrying that after two games they're missing him, or one, he only played one game, like, you know, in, uh, MLS game. But um, no, I mean, you know, th- that was he went with that decision. It didn't it didn't work out. In retrospect, he probably thought you know he should have done something else. Um, but yeah. He'll know for, they'll know for next time that, that that maybe didn't work. Yeah, or he Breck Shea wasn't suitable for it. He's like a utility guy, isn't he? Breck Shea. He can play in a lot of different areas, but as you said, I've never really played him since centre half before. I don't. I don't. I mean, listen, coach can do whatever he wants. Any coach can do whatever he wants. But I, you know, there's some moves that just don't necessarily make a whole lot of sense, especially when he has not played that position in a long, long, long time. And I don't even know how many times he's played it in his professional career. It would be like saying, all right, well, maybe, and this is an exaggeration, but like, you know, Steve's being like, oh, well, you know, you just try things out and see how it goes. All right, let's put Nick Marsman up top and see if, if he scores some goals. Because, you know, maybe, maybe, it's just gotta, you gotta try it. I, I just don't think it made sense. I didn't see where it made sense to bring in Breck Shea as a center back. But anyway, let, let, let's, let's move on from the back line because I'm of the firm belief and I want to state this very clearly that this is not just on the defense because a lot of people are saying that like, I've seen a lot of the reaction the defense is terrible uh you know how, how how can this defense be so bad obviously when you see five goals given up the first thing you think about is the defense but it's not just the defense's fault yes there were some very poor individual mistakes especially as the goal started coming in and confidence started to go for Inter Miami there were more and more mistakes uh, Christopher McVeigh's uh, terrible pass. I'm blanking off on if it was in the build-up to the third goal or the fourth goal, but that that was just almost inexcusable. But it's just part of the, the of the fact that they were down so badly and, and and trying to force things a bit a bit there. But for me, this is not just on the defense. This is on the team, on the team and the game plan because. Inter Miami could not keep the ball because of the game plan that they had. They wanted to counterattack. They wanted to get in behind the, the Austin FC center back. Something that Gregory said post game. They and you never ever saw them get in behind. So they lost the ball very cheaply. Hit a lot of hopeless long balls that Austin FC quickly recovered, and then they started their attacking sequences. And when you give the other team the ball that often and that much and that easily. That other team, if they have some semblance of quality, they will find eventually a hole in the defense to break you down. Now, Austin FC was especially, especially effective in this game, and they were clinical in the final third. But that's not just on the defense. If the defense is facing constant waves of pressure, that that you like, like Jose said, you have to defend with the ball. Keeping the ball means the other team doesn't have the ball, and the other team can't hurt you if they don't have the ball. So... There's a lot of things that need work. Yes, the defense needs work, but so does the midfield. So does the the strike partnership. So does the ta- so do the tactics. The whole thing needs work. And look, Phil Neville has said this this that this group needs a crap load of work. Still, he he acknowledged that um, in preseason, I believe, even after the first game of the season. But five to one loss is a is an ugly ugly defeat, and and hopefully not a sign of things to come because it's it's it was an ugly loss and, and it wasn't a good performance for almost any part of that game and and that's that's not excusable 
that's not excusable because this is a team that Phil Neville has brought on. Um, you know, he's he's had a big big say in, and you know he's talked about how hungry they are and, and athletic and uh, all these things. They cannot keep. They cannot get routed like this on a consistent basis like they did last year. That that just can't happen. That can't happen. Not again. Not again. And I think Inter Miami fans would agree with that. Jose, switching gears, let's talk about some positives. For me, Robert Taylor coming off the bench, he showed a willingness to get forward and try to make things happen. Took a few shots. Um, had more attacking ideas and, and looked to try to make things happen. So I, I liked what I saw from him in, in about a 10-15 minute spell, but then his impact kind of faded once Austin FC took took the game by the scruff of the neck. Again, I would say Leonardo Campana, you know, he got his first goal as well, something for Inter Miami fans to at least cheer about. That made the score 3-1 uh, when Campana scored. So a couple of positives there. Anything else? that you would say was a positive from this one, or is it is it pretty much just those couple of things? Well, you also touched on the, the Phil Neville adjusting the, the, the formation, but anything else at all from this one that, that you... Uh... Right. Yeah, with Phil, with Phil, you know, making that adjustment, it's a little bit more off the field in terms of confidence of him as, as a coach in this group, and I, and I really like that. I think it's important for Campana to score, you know, uh, maybe not um, over the weekend or right now. We, we don't put a lot of emphasis on that. But, you know, uh, just having the uh, the emotions go through, leave the pressure behind him of not being able to score, you know, this could be a big goal for him moving on on the rest of uh, onto the rest of the season. I would say one thing, you know, uh, to me it's a positive as well that, um, you know, we, we were finally able to see um, uh, what this team can do offensively when they stay away of the, of the five-man back line. You know, we have an idea now of, of what the vision for this team is. At some point, I would think, you know, if he was able to do it against Austin, uh, I think at some point we might we might be able to see the, the same formation to start a game. And, yeah. you know, that's important. That's, that's part of the development of a team, right? You know, Phil is talking about it's going to take some time. Um, he started clearly with the defensive side, you know, playing, thinking more about, you know, um, staying in the game rather than go and win the game. Um, so I, I think that's a positive, you know, if if, if you look at it and uh, as a as an analyst and and as a fan, I think the one question that we had prior to the start of the regular season is how is this thing is this thing going to look when they actually need to score. We were never never able to see that. So now we had at least something to look at, and I think that's that's the positive. I mean, that, I mean, it's it's not a lot. It's, it's a five to one result, and 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 you know the the one thing to me that is uh, um, that makes me think about this uh, this result is that you know the negativity is back around the team, and, and that's the one thing. Do you remember uh, prior to the game in the, in the pregame, I was talking about the best case scenario and worst case scenario. Well, the worst case scenario happened, and we're still talking about this game rather than just moving on to LAFC, which, you know, it, I guess the, another result, maybe even if they dropped the game but had another result more uh, a little bit closer than what it was, we'll be thinking in a little bit of a, a positive mindset moving forward. So I, I, I do want to ask you one thing about the post-game press conference. Because, and I, I'm going to hear from Steve first because he hasn't said much in, in a bit. Do you think it's a problem that, that Phil Neville said the players did not follow the game plan? Is that concerning to you from the outside, Steve? I mean, yeah, I would, you would say, yeah. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't sound great, does it? But I mean, it was, what, it was what, one game. Yeah, it just didn't, it didn't work out. And it, he's saying that you know, they didn't take stuff on board. I mean, I guess, you know, there were probably some home truths said afterwards. They got together and tried to sort it out. But, yes, you know, I guess it's a new team and they're learning new things, I guess. But, yeah, no, you don't, you don't need that, really. Well, so for me, for me, and I want to hear Jose as well, but for me, there's two things there. I'll start with what I think. First is that if this team, if these players are getting away from the game plan, that's still on you. For some reason, your message, your game plan isn't getting through to the players. Now, why is that? That's something that they have to resolve and figure out because we heard that last year as well, that the players didn't stick to the game plan at certain moments. So why is now almost a completely new team 
not sticking to the game plan. Why, why, if that's the case, is this team having the same issues that we saw with a completely different roster at times in 2021? That's the first part. The second part is there's quietly, quietly a growing concern from people around the team about whether Phil Neville takes enough accountability and responsibility for when things don't go right. Because rarely do you hear him say, this one's on me. When, when, rarely do you he- hear him lift up his hand and say, I got it wrong. I didn't make the right decision here. You rarely hear that from him. And I'll, I'll just quickly juxtaposition it to Gregory Post game, who one of his first comments in his post game press conference was, I want to apologize to the fans and, and say sorry and ask for forgiveness for this defeat. You don't hear Phil Neville say that. And someone that's not a big Inter-Miami follower, someone that's not a big Inter-Miami fan, texted me after the game on Sunday and said something along those lines of, oh, uh, Mr. Excuses is how he referenced Phil Neville. So there is this growing, quietly, sentiment about Phil Neville not taking accountability. Jose, what are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I, I think I can agree with that. I was expecting on, on Sunday um, Phil to come out and, and say, um, I, 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 I didn't make the right decision, you know, with, with bringing, maybe not necessarily saying I'm bringing Greg Shea in, but given an idea that tactically maybe he should have done something different or adjust early on in the game. You know, it was clear after Austin scored the second goal that, you know, tactics were not necessarily working. Um, so, yeah, I did expect that in, from him in the press conference, and it didn't happen. Um, to, the, to the previous point, I would say this, you know, about about players not, not following the game plan. I think maybe that comes down to the part where mentally the team was not strong enough when they were um, down, right? Because it did seem like something similar to what we saw last year happen in, in the sense that they were down a goal or two and, and, and it felt like they, they went, just went away from the game mentally. And, and that's where Austin, obviously, playing at home, you know, playing with a lot of confidence as well, they, they were just able to move past Inter Miami easily. So, um, listen... Still very early. I think it is it is very early still. I think I think we all agreed in preseason that, you know, this team needed a lot of work. So I don't want to go into conclusions into this in the second week because I think a lot can change over the weekend if Inter Miami for some reason is able to win against LA, LAFC, which it's it's I don't think it's gonna happen, but still it could happen. And then next week we're not going to be all positive and, and thinking that everything has been solved and they are going to win the MLS Cup, right? I think it's very early. We, we have to give them some time. No, abs- absolutely. That's the good news. There's 32 games left in the MLS season. There's a lot of time for Inter Miami to correct things. But when you lose this badly, I don't think you can just sweep it under the rug and say, all right, we're on to the next one. I think that there are some some very big no, things but, that need to on. be addressed. It's- I was saying, but even the, you know, what he said afterwards, we know that we've got some new players in the team. They're going to take time to gel and learn. They've got to learn fast and learn on the job. It's a, it's a steep learning curve for this new team. I mean, that you can't say that's not that's not true. That is a hundred percent true. You know, but we have every belief and confidence in them, and that we need to rectify some of the things we saw in terms of mistakes. I mean, yeah, they're a young team put together, and they, of course they're going to make mistakes. And this, the learning curve is steep because you're going to get punished when you when you don't perform like they did like they did the other day. So, you know, there is some mitigation. I do think he he is honest. And some managers, you never get them, you know, criticising themselves or holding their hands up. It's not a it's not a sort of widespread thing. You know, it just depends how you want to play it, really. So, you know, honest Phil. <laughs> okay, well, look, last thing I'll say on it is I know Phil Neville puts his blood, sweat, and tears into it. I know he is intensely trying to make this team a winning team. So part of me... Seeing that up close and personal, there is an element of me on the human side that feels bad for him. But he's a young head coach, and I think at times the 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 desire to win is maybe clouding some of the decisions that are being made. Because again, for example, Breck Shea at center back, I just I just don't don't understand that one. And I think that's just one microcosm uh, or one sign of of 
bigger issues that, that that can play out and that have played out in different moments. Just go back to last year. Kelvin Leardam was playing center back at times um, in different situations, and he was giving up a lot of goals. I think Phil Neville's desire to win is so great that sometimes it does not allow him to make the best best decisions. So hopefully he can grow like as this, as this team can grow because Phil Neville is also a young head coach, still learning, still figuring his style and, and his overall method. And I do agree with you, Jose, that Maybe the five-man backline that he's been married to practically since last summer, maybe this game has opened his eyes to potentially changing that, if not this weekend, at some point on a more uh, permanent basis later on in the year. Let's let quickly say let me let me say one thing. I don't think he needs to change it for every game because it is very clear that as of right now, Inter Miami, uh, especially when playing a team like LAFC or one of the top teams in the league, they have to be defensive minded, but you know, there are games within the regular season in which you can allow yourself to be aggressive, even though you are a young team and still developing. Right. So that's just to clear, clarify that point. I do agree that the back, the back five is effective depending on the, on the rival, but at times, especially when you don't have those five players that, and all of them are playing in their natural position, then maybe do something else and try to surprise your opponent a little bit because, like we mentioned, again, it was very predictable. So that's just to clarify. I do agree with the five-man back backline. It's okay at times, but you have to know, you have to recognize when you're facing an opponent that you can actually attack. You just reminded me quickly, I'll add this, you just reminded me of another problem I had with that back five in the, in the starting lineup. And it's not about Breck Shea. Jairo Quinteros was played as the sweeper, and Christopher McVeigh was played as the as the right center back. Jairo Quinteros told me in the week leading up to the game that his preferred position, if he had to choose between right and left, he said there's not a big difference, but that if he had to pick one, he would prefer to be the left center back because he's able to open up uh, to his right and to his left, so he's able to play in both postures, and dos perfiles, as we say in Spanish. And that Christopher McVeigh's I, I believe Phil Neville said this after the game. Maybe I could be wrong here. My memory could be uh, faulty. But I, I believe he said Christopher McVeigh's best position is right center back. Phil Neville said that post game. I believe. So Christopher McVeigh is not playing his best position when everybody's healthy and available because he's been playing left center back. So that that to me is, means you're taking a player that's not uh, excuse me. That's the, you're taking a player from from his best position and moving him to a different spot just to try to force this system. And that's to me is one of the issues is that instead of forming the system around the players he has, he's trying to force the players he has into his system and it's not working or it didn't work this weekend. And, and no, yeah, I don't think where if Chris McVay plays at the left center half or right center half impacts a massive amount. It definitely yeah, impacts. It absolutely impacts. It absolutely impacts. He says it's his stronger position, but he can still play on the other side. We played on the other side the other day. I mean, do you play like players to the... Do you want to... Ideally, would you play players to their strengths? Yes or no? Ideally. Yeah, I know, but you're talking about a minimal... I, I, I don't think that would... Im, you're making it out to be like a huge impactful thing. I just I don't think it would be as impactful. Yeah, it's, it's not ideal, but in for, just for that, if he's playing the left or right set, as a set half, I mean... He's, he looked like a solid sort of player, which could probably cope with it. I don't know. We haven't seen enough. There, there, I mean, if you sure, if but... you think that's a minimal difference, that's fine. I respect your opinion, but I, 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 it is not a massive difference, but it is a significant difference, and that's one of the reasons I think that Phil Neville also went with Breck Shea because Breck Shea's left footed and he can play in that left center back role and and be comfortable there because when you when you're playing and you're not on your preferred foot. You can get uncomfortable and not be in, in the correct posture to pass the ball. You can lose the ball. Yeah, yeah but he's dribble. talking about as one of, of of two in the middle, isn't he? He's not talking about left or, right, or left or wing, left or back or right back, is he? It's it still makes a difference. It's still there's still a difference there. Yeah, I mean there is, but not as not it's not as great as if he was playing on the wing. Oh, the absolutely. Middle, I mean, I didn't. So, but I'm not. I'm not saying all that. But I didn't well, say it that. It doesn't make that much difference, really. It doesn't. Well, like, yeah, I, I kind of agree with Steve on this one. Yeah. yeah, I think it's something to note, something to think about, but I don't think it's that big a deal. I mean, especially after watching Quintero's play, I think, you know, he's, he's good enough. I mean, he can perform. Yeah. In it. Now, listen, this all gets um, sort of uh, fixed if he plays with four in the back, Rick Shea left back, 
Where, 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 did McVay, right. where did McVay play in the second half? And in the in the right back, and that's it. And no, that's no. It. Where, where did Christopher McVay make play in the second half? Four, make them play with four. Make them play Gregory Jose, and Mott in the Jose, middle. Where did Christopher McVay play in the second half of Austin, of the game against Austin FC? You you tell me. You tell me. I don't know. He what was to say. he was playing the left center back of the back four. So now he wasn't okay, on, he wasn't so... on the now he wasn't on the right side. Now he's on the left side. Your posture changes. And again, for me, that is a criticism that I have of Phil Neville in terms of changing a lot of pieces too often. That, that was that's another criticism I have. And again, for me, this game is on him. That that's it. That's it. That's all I'll say with regards to this game. This argument's right. got echoes of the bizarro on going on the international duty argument that we have. I think. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, let's switch gears quickly to other talking points. Uh, not on this game specifically. One of them, let's start with Gonzalo Higuain versus Fabian Herbers. Fabian Herbers, if you don't know who he is, that name does not ring a bell. He is a Chicago Fire attacker. And he was on a podcast last week. The audio came out on Friday, if I'm not mistaken. Having a real, real go at Gonzalo Higuain. What are your guys' thoughts starting with Steve? Well, the fact is, I'm looking at the, the mail online and the head, it just gives us just the most wonderful headline. Fabian Herbers launched a scathing attack of pathetic Gonzalo Green as he slams destructive and negative body language during the opening MLS stalemate. Um, yeah, I mean, it's certainly out, it's outspoken, isn't it? I mean, it's, I mean in the, as journalists, we get very, very excited when, uh, when you see a player sort of break rank and really sort of criticise someone else. But he clearly was, uh, he's not Gonzalo Green's biggest fan, is he? He two footed sl- lid tackled him essentially. Like he just went two footed, studs up, um, and took the red card for it essentially. If we're doing a, a game comparison, Jose, what did you think of those comments? What did you make of those comments? Uh, I don't know. To me, it's not that big a deal. Um, listen, I, I think this is something that we have talked about before. This is something that even Iwain has addressed. Um, I I I kind of sense a frustration from Iwain again over the weekend, but you know I think it's it's just that desire to win. So you know when you get those comments from from a player from 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 Chicago Fire in this case, I mean it's just like an observation. I would take it like an observation of of what he thinks is going on, what he saw on the I field. Mean, when, when he says "f that guy," and calls him pathetic said his and he says his body language is so negative something that has been a talking point dating back to last year about Gonzalo Higuain I mean it, it made headlines for a reason it made headlines for a reason it made headlines because they were excellent quotes and they, he actually slagged him off but I mean you know so what I mean, we've seen Higuain that's just that's just, that's the way he plays the game he don't wears his heart on his sleeve he is always I've defended moaning. Higuain yeah, and they, they had a battle on the pitch. But when an Inter Miami player comes out with with the same reaction, same exact words, or something similar, then I think that's something that we can actually talk about. But other than that, I think it's mainly what we have seen on TV and and when we are physically in the stadium. I mean, it's not 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 nothing new there. Do you think a teammate would come out and say something publicly? No way, they won't get involved in that. No way. I mean, we're, we're going to speak to Phil Neville, aren't we? Uh, late, late, later on this week, that's a good, that's a good thing line to put to him for sure. But, I mean, Rodolfo Pizarro probably came the closest to doing so when he when he finished playing his last game or his, yeah his last game for Inter Miami last year when he went on Twitter and started liking all the critical tweets about Gonzalo Higuain. I don't think you're going to get a teammate lambasting his 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 other teammate. Um, generally speaking, in, in in an interview, I just don't think that's going to happen. But it doesn't mean that 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 sentiment's not there. That that these players might not feel that. I mean, they're human beings. They absolutely could feel that way about Iguain. And again, I've defended him and his frustration, while also saying that sometimes he does take it take it over uh, over the line at times. So anyway, uh, let's quickly just switch gears to this week's practice that we were able to attend. We will we will have a press conference with uh, Phil Neville later this week, but we did attend practice on Tuesday, and one of the observations there was Damian Lowe was training. Not sure what his status is for for Saturday afternoon's game, but he was training, and, and, and not everybody from the starting team was taking part in the practice session. I think it was their first session back from Austin. Again, this was Tuesday, so I think they had Monday off, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. 
and it was a pretty light, light session. We were able to stay through the whole duration of it, but not, not a whole lot of tactical work done, just a lot of individual drills mostly with the ball. So Damian Lowe did partake in that. In that. Uh, we, did, we did see Robbie Robinson, but he didn't do a whole lot off to the side with the trainer. He looks like he's still a step behind the likes of Bryce Duke, uh, and Ryan Saylor. Jovan Jones also took part in, in, in some individual work with uh, Saylor and Duke. We also saw one more person, and that is Maynard Figueroa, Honduran center back, 38 Wigan years legend. old, Wigan legend. <laughs> and the Honduran national team captain. Jose, you are a proud, proud, proud Catracho, a proud Honduran. What can you tell us about Maynard Figueroa and what he could bring to this team because... I am told that he is on trial. This is not just a training exercise. He is on trial with the team. Well, I can tell you so many things about Minor Fiera, but you know, let's start with age because I know that's the, that's the first thing that um, fans will, will look at. He's 38 years old, but let me tell you, he's a different 38 years old. He's incredibly fit, and he has always been throughout his career. Um, so he's. I'm sure he's in very good shape. He's... He's the captain of the national team still, not doing very well, of course, but you know, he's still the captain. That means something. Um, <laughs> listen, I, 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 I think he's a player. He's a player that can contribute. I mean, I don't think he will be a regular starter, but you know, especially in a case in, like uh, like the scenario we we saw over the weekend, where you know uh, you, you were forced to put Greg Shea as the center back, that wouldn't happen with right. Figueroa on, on on the roster. Um, he has been under some criticism on the national team because, yes, lately, you know, he has a couple of mistakes there that cost the Honduras games. But, you know, I think it's different when you play at the international level, playing World Cup qualifiers, a lot of pressure, especially Honduras is struggling throughout the entire um, uh, qualifying phase. You know, there was a lot of pressure on him. It's different in Inter Miami. He's more a role player here, not a not a star. And he has a lot of help as well. I think he he has um, players around him that he can actually rely on. And so I I do believe he if he's able to sign, I think it will be a good signing. You know, obviously he lives in South Florida, played for Houston Dynamo last year, but he lives in South Florida, so he knows he knows what it is to to live in South Florida, to train in South Florida. So the the adjustment period would be minimal for him. So I, I and I think he 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 would be ready to contribute. You know, as if they sign him um, this week, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he's a, if he's able to play on Saturday. He's just an experienced player. Oh, and one more thing, you know, he's very familiar with the uh, five man back line. So I guess that's something that feel uh, will will like. And I do believe that you know there's a little bit of um, of an advantage for for minor because. You know, all that history in the Premier League, and I think Phil might respect that part of his career and and, and maybe give him a chance. I was going to say he won got he won a goal of the season. Um, yeah. In, yeah, two, yeah, yeah, goal, goal of the season. What um, year did he win that in, Steve? Sorry, I had it here. And I just, sorry, 2009-10 2000, for the goal against Stoke uh, from, the, from pretty much from the halfway line, wasn't it? A free kick. Um, yeah. So, nice. Yeah, he's had a good career. He was at Wigan 2008, made 100, over 150 appearances for Wigan and went to Hull for two years. And he got a green card in 2020, so he qualifies right. as a domestic player for MLS roster purposes, which, of course, you will know very well from your time managing into Miami. So there you go. <laughs> I, I, I chuckled when, when Jose was initially responding to, to the question about Maynard Figueroa because I was just thinking to myself, man, I hope that a Peruvian player never comes to enter Miami because I might get like you guys and start gushing over my compatriots because, you know, Steve, I, I, I obviously tease about, about his defending of Phil Neville and Jose, you just gushed over Maynard Figueroa. Um, wow. I know he's, I know he's a compatriot. He's a Honduran, but wow. Wow. Look, he's 38 years no, old. Honestly, he's 38 he's... years old. He's on a free for a reason. He's, he's, he, there's a reason why he had, he's not under contract with a team right now. Because of his age, you just said he's having rough moments with uh, Hunter and national team when he's played. So he's clearly on the tail end of his career, um, on the decline. However, like you mentioned, for me, it's a clear sign of them looking for more coverage at center back. Because they saw this past weekend, you know what, we don't, what we have now is not enough. What we have currently 
is is not good enough for what we need for the 34 game regular season because if we go down one player now right that i'm just ta- speaking like how how they probably thinking if they go down one player then that puts them in a tough spot and they have to start tinkering and moving pieces and, and trying to figure it all out especially if they want to stick with the five man back line so you know he's on trial right now we'll see how how his time here unfolds if he actually ends up getting a contract offer and does sign again he's he's mostly a depth piece uh, I don't. I don't imagine he will be a like you said a regular regular starter. Although football is full of surprises, you know, never know. Maybe he comes in at one point, takes advantage of his opportunity, and she looks really good, and and is a starter the rest of the way. But I, I would imagine he's just there for depth purposes if he does get signed. Well, you know, if if he, if he's here for depth purposes, the reality is that when you're playing with five in the back, you know, opportunities, you know, will come for him, right? Whether because he can play it as a center back as a sweeper as well, so you know he he can he can take over three positions basically you know uh, as a sweeper, left center back, and left wing back. So you know options will be there. You're right. I mean he's 38 years old and that's probably the first thing that teams look at. But at this point in his career, he's exactly he's looking exactly uh, to continue playing looking exactly at the scenario that Inter Miami is providing, right? You know, a team that they don't have high expectations. They don't want to win the title. Um, they have young players and they need veterans and leadership. And, you know, that's what he brings to the table. And that's why he, he was not able to find a team. Um, I know for a fact he had a, um, offers from USL Championship, but he didn't. He felt that, you know, he still had a shot at MLS. And um, he he wants to live in South Florida as well. That's that's the one another thing. So. You know, I think it, it could be something that will work out for both both ways. Yeah, I imagine they sign him on a one-year deal if they sign him. And, you know, yeah. they just have yeah. him for coverage for, for this year for when the situation arises. But anyway, let's leave it there for this lengthy, lengthy first segment. We have our preview of the next game against LAFC coming up. So let's take a quick break, and we'll get to that after this. Uh for me, for me, the disappointment today was is that, that we didn't stick to what we we've been working on all week, what we've been working on all preseason about the shape, the discipline, the compactness of the team. All of a sudden, when you go a goal down, you, you've got to remain in the game for as long as possible and keep that discipline in shape. And and we started to do individual things, and and that cost us. Okay, guys, it's that time of the week where we preview Inter Miami's next game, and that takes place on Saturday afternoon at Drive Pink Stadium in Fort Lauderdale. The opponent is LAFC, a team that's off to a good start this season. They've gotten four points from their first two games, but they have a new head coach in place. Bob Bradley is gone. In there now is former U.S. men's national team right back Steve Chirundolo, who is in his first MLS head coaching gig. And joining us to preview the opponent and the match is an LA-based MLS reporter who writes for Yahoo.com slash Yahoo FC, however you want to look at it. His name is Andy Diosa. He is Colombian, so I will ask him to start. Como estas, mi hermano? Todo bien. Happy to be here. <laughs> Talk a little LAFC into Miami with you guys. Yeah, man. Our Colombian listeners will love to hear that todo bien in the Colombian accent because there's a lot of of you guys over here in South Florida. But let's not uh, let's not waste too much time. Let's just jump right into it. What kind of game should Inter Miami fans expect from LAFC coming into this one? Week three, Carlos Vela, I know is a question mark, but what should Inter Miami fans expect from the opponent coming into this game? I think it'll be an interesting one. Uh, the first thing I have to get off off of the top is this is the earliest game LAFC will play this season, mm-hmm. which I know sometimes people don't like to use that as you know any any bit of a factor. But I think it is if you if you factor in traveling across the country and playing what would account to 10:30 a.m. Pacific time. So right. uh, a little bit interesting there. But I think overall LAFC is going to try to try to keep establishing these ideas. Obviously, it's a new head coach under Steve Trundolo, and what they're really trying to focus on right now is is getting these um, these more clear chances. They're looking there in, in the game against Portland. They they basically dominated with 68 percent of possession. But I think the one takeaway that he had of the of the game was that they didn't create enough clear chances. They created enough chances. They all shot Portland 25 to 10, uh, but only six were on net compared to Portland's four. So I think that's really what um, Trundolo is trying to get this team to do. And it's a little bit of a struggle what they kind of saw last year too, where they were dominating but not creating enough chances. So I think. That should be the main um, point of focus for them. But 
once again, that team is not changing much from what Bob Bradley had them do for the four years, where it's uh, really dominate possession, push the game forward. Maybe they're not as aggressive as they were under Bob Bradley, but I think that we'll see a little bit of the same against Miami, where they're trying to really push the game forward, especially Miami coming off of conceding those five goals to Austin. I think uh, LAFC will definitely try to see an opportunity and take advantage there, whether it's using the wings or using the midfield, whatever combination of play that they have uh, to really try to dictate that pace. But like I said, it's a, it's an early game. It's their first road one of the season. So I think they also have to be a little uh, cautious about, you know, trying to do a little too much because that, that, that definitely factors in. Now, you touched on an important element going into this game for LAFC and that, that this would be a morning game if they played it in LA, right? So do you know when the team is traveling this week? Are they leaving Thursday from the city uh, of Los Angeles? Or are they are they leaving on Friday? When when is the team departing Los Angeles to try to get here and adjust to the time? So the team practices tomorrow here in LA, and then they fly out Friday morning. So they're flying out uh, on Friday. They'll be there Friday afternoon, evening, and then they'll have less than 24 hours, which, once again, going back to the past days of, of Bob Bradley and, and coaches that are a little more experienced in this league, they've talked about a lot about those kind of travels where you don't have a full day or so to kind of get uh, acclimated. So like I said earlier, people don't like to use those factors as excuses, and I'm definitely not trying to, but I think they're they're valid to even bring up because it does change a little bit of the dynamic. Sure, absolutely. It, it could change the approach as well. You know, if, if, if they're, you know, maybe not going to come out guns blazing and, and maybe they'll try to conserve some energy in that way. But Steve, I, I know you have something there. Well, let's, let's just hope they have their breakfast nice and early so they're not hungry when they, because uh, obviously it's so early, so early. But anyway, I mean, and when you when you look down the roster, obviously one name, Carlos Vela, sort of stands out, but there's a bit of an injury concern about him, right? Yes, yes. Carlos Vela was subbed out in, at halftime against Portland this weekend. Um, Steve Trundle called it precautionary reasons. They said that they're not concerned about it being anything too severe, but I think that automatically raises red flags all over the place because we've mm -hmm. heard the same thing in the past two seasons when, when Bob Bradley was around. And I think with Vela, it's, it's important to note that he's really playing for a contract right now. And, and that's the, the biggest uh, factor for Vela is after that first game against Colorado, he has a hat trick and everybody, you know, is doing backflips and, and saying he's going to be the MVP again and, you know, all these things. And now game two, we're, we're talking about he plays 45 minutes and, and now he's a, a question mark. And you have to remember last season in the opener against Austin, he played about 20-something minutes and he was subbed out and then missed some time as well. So Carlos Vela in, injury concerns, whether or not they're saying it's minor or major, um, it's, definitely, it's definitely questionable for me. Uh, we'll find out tomorrow more clarity, hopefully, if uh, he travels, if, if, what the, you know, if he plays or whatnot. So I'll definitely try to have some, some news on that, Twitter, whatever the case may be. But I think it is important to note that when Vela's out of the game, you have players like Brian Rodriguez, you have players like Chicho Arango who, who really have to step up and, and kind of fill that void. And, and his natural replacement right now is uh, Mahalo Poku, who's a young player, but very energetic. But obviously you can't replace Carlos Vela uh, many ways, I think, right now in this league with any team. So uh, it would be a big loss if he, if he isn't able to play. But as I've known LAFC to be with Carlos Vela through the past years, they will be very, very cautious about this injury. If it's anything that they're a little concerned with, he probably won't play because they're going to try to obviously, you know, uh, like we say um, in, in Spanish is basically to try to make sure he's at his best and as they should. But once again, you bring in that contract um, discrepancy, whether or not he's going to stay in L.A., whether or not he's going to go because his contract is up in the summer. And the conversation now is if he wants to go back to Europe or if he wants to stay. So LAFC and Carlos Vela are at a tough point and this kind of complicates everything a little bit more with, with an injury. So we'll have to keep an eye on it. But um, I guess, you know, after coming off a hat trick for the first game and, and this, it's it's not a good time for LAFC at all. Is he, is he still speaking? He, does he do much media now? I remember the last time I went to LAFC, the people, the LA guys were upset that he doesn't really talk for a designated player. You know, we're, we're lucky. I mean, well, obviously Franco speaks great, speaks Spanish. So they, a lot of, get a lot of time with Higuain and the kind of top guys. But what what's, what's the situation with there? No, no. Carlos Vela has has remained the same person he's he's been since he got here. Uh, it was actually funny we were discussing after the the home opener against Colorado that he scored a hat trick, and any player in MLS to score a hat trick, being a superstar player of that team, would 100% talk to media after the game, right? That just be would be the expectation, the captain, you know, things like that. He didn't speak after that game, which is it's I think to us that are local now is isn't really surprising. That's ridiculous. That's um, but ridiculous. It, by the way, that's ridiculous. It, 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 and I think, you know, I think we raised a point within the media here. But once again, now with the injury concerns, it raises all these different conversations. And without 
uh, full transparency, either from LAFC staff or from Vela himself, then we only got what we can to work under. So I think the one thing I will say is Steve Sherundolo in, in his short time that he's here, he has been very transparent. So I'm interested to see how he handles um, those questions tomorrow because well, Bob Rally it was a lot of, you know, uh, you know how Bob is. Let's just break that way. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to really get into that. So it was a lot of back and forth. But uh, I think I think Sherundolo has been pretty transparent. So I think uh, we will get some answers tomorrow as to where that stands, hopefully. Don't worry. I don't think Bob Bradley listens to Miami Total Football Radio. So if, if you say anything, I don't think he's going to come after you. But maybe he Bob. will. Maybe he will. Bob, Bob, Bob's everywhere. Bob's everywhere. He's got his fingerprints everywhere. Uh you, you touched on Steve Chirondolo, who's in his first coaching job in MLS. Uh, that's former U.S. men's national team. I don't know if great is a, is the proper word, but he's definitely underrated. He definitely had a very, very solid career uh, at the club level and at the international level. But he's still a bit of a mystery as a head coach. How much of what you've seen so far from LAFC, is it just natural from, from him adopting last year's team? And how much of it do you think is also, you know, him starting to implement his ideas? And do you think as the season goes on, you'll see more and more uh, different tactical wrinkles from Chirondolo? I mean, I, obviously it's a small sample size, but I've actually been pretty impressed from what I've seen from him because I think from preseason, a lot of the players really bought in. And that was one thing a lot of the players mentioned, more so the new players, which obviously gives you a good look inside is they they really bought into his uh, ideas. And he that was the first thing he did was, I'm going to implement these type of ideas and we're going to move forward. Um, but it was it was also a point of his to say, you know, we're not going to be the same exact team that uh, LAFC was used to. So I think obviously he took some of the stuff that Bob Bradley had mixed in with his own um, ideologies. But I think he's been pretty solid. Uh, the one thing I, I really like is that he's not uh, basing his his uh, decisions on the players that have been there. So, for example, a player like Latif Blessing, who had been a staple really for this LAFC team for four years, kind of gets the short end of the stick when you bring in players like Ilya Sanchez, Kellen Acosta. But Chirondolo says, you know, we're going to see who was the best in the preseason, and that's what we're going to roll with. Uh, another player, Chicho Arango, and that opener didn't start. And, you know, LAFC was saying that there were uh, injury concerns. I believe that he made it just, he might have just been a little not fit uh, to go full 90 in that first opening game, and he didn't start that game, and he came off the bench in the second half. But I think those seeing those things from a new head coach really show that he's not scared to call the shots because ultimately that is what he's doing. So um, from def- from the defensive end, I think that it's it's of note that LAFC has only conceded that one goal in those two games, and it was a really great goal by Jimmy Chara, my boy, fellow Colombian. Uh, <laughs> But Chirondolo, his his focus is defensively because that's what he played. That's what he that's what he likes. And I think that in these past few seasons for LAFC, defensively they have been very sloppy and they've had a, a mixture of players. But I think ever since that Walker Zimmerman trade beyond, uh, things have been a little up and down for that for that back line. So to say that they've only conceded that one goal from Chara in two games is is uh, pretty impressive. I think they have a lot of depth. I think this is the deepest team that LAFC has had. So. He has also made it a note to say, you know, we're not going to be afraid to juggle players and get everybody in the mix. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see a lot of those players that maybe haven't played too much in those first two games uh, play against Miami. Players like Kim Moon Juan, players like Latif Blessing, Pancho Janela. Uh, there's just a, a lot of players on this roster that maybe haven't gotten some burn. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's a little bit of a rotation because uh, Kellen Acosta ha- picked up a knock against the um, the, the Timbers. Franco Escobar also did Diego Palacio, so I think this is the perfect time for him to to kind of juggle that roster. So um, it, it would be it would be interesting to see how he lines up. But all in all, I think we have to give him the benefit of the doubt in just two games. He's definitely shown that he has qualities, and like I said, he has a lot to work with. So uh, you can't really you can't really fault the team for for trying to you know use all these players to, to his advantage because there's a lot of players there. And you you beat me to the punch because I was going to ask you who are some of the other danger men for interim Jaime to watch, but you've already named a bunch. I just want to ask ask you quickly about Carlos Vela and go back to, to the subject of his injury. What is the injury? Because I saw the press conference and they were like, oh, they, we took him off for precautionary reasons, but they never said what it was, at least not in the press conference. I don't know if during the game um, it was it was obvious or not, but what what is the injury he's dealing with? Do you know? I think if anybody knows, that's uh, they should play the lottery because <laughs> that, that's the one thing with with uh, with LAFC and Vela. It's a lot of a lot of hidden uh, hidden information. It seems like to me. So tomorrow we'll be more direct with him and and like I said, go at him and find out exactly what it looks like. On after the game, they didn't say much. During the game, nothing was really said about that. But if it is a knee injury, then then the alarms have to be going off because that's what he had been dealing with in these past few seasons. Right. So like I mentioned earlier. 
it's a lot of uh, question marks on that end, but we'll find out more tomorrow for sure. We, we've definitely tried to adapt a little bit over here, and um, we've had some some better results. So uh, hopefully, hopefully you guys get some answers because I, I think obviously it's it's a fair question and, and fair information for the general public to have, especially LAFC fans, to know what their star man is dealing with. Whether they want to share how severe it is or not, you know, whatever, that's up to them. But at least we, the, you know, the injury, what it is, should be known. I mean, these are professional sports teams we're talking about. But anyway, Steve, go ahead. No, no, just just finally, last week we had Matthew McConaughey and, and, and Austin. This week we got Will Ferrell, LFC versus David Beckham. I mean, it's uh, you you do just like us. You've got a sort of front office glitt- littered with a lot of sort of interesting names, right? Absolutely, I think that. It's pretty cool to see that happen, and, and obviously you guys know well. Uh, Miami's first game ever was here in Los Angeles, and we, were and there, yeah. we talked to to David Beckham prior to, um, and he oh it's a I forget was it Will Ferrell or something like that. Somebody they were talking about you know the back and forth kind of little bit of banter, and then the same thing with um, with Austin. Austin's first game was was here in in LA as well last season, and and he uh, McConaughey talked about he had talked to Will Ferrell and made a little bit of a, a friendly <laughs> wager. So it's just funny to see that that. Cool. is where MLS is at but I think it only helps you know it helps a little bit of outside interest and obviously we know how big of a player David Beckham is and one thing about Beckham is he's obviously very beloved here in LA sure. because of time with the Galaxy but uh I don't know exactly how LAFC fans feel about it but you know it's always um, it's always an interesting interesting fact to see a player like Beckham and you know where that team is and how that team is gone but uh it is fun it's, it's very fun obviously a lot of names big names and even though it's an early game, I think eyes will definitely be on it because, like I said earlier, Miami's coming off of a tough game. They're still looking to kind of get their feet under them, and LAFC is gonna is gonna be traveling across the country. So I'll make sure I set my alarm and I'm up early enough to watch it. <laughs> uh, Andy, the last one I have for you, and I think that we have for you, is what is the key to the game in your opinion for LAFC? The tactical key to the game in the matchup, obviously, score more goals, not give up as many goals. I mean, but just more more specifically, what does LAFC need to do on the field to to come away with a result from this one, whether it's a draw or, or a win that they'll try to implement or you think they'll try to implement against Inter Miami? I think my important factor would be for them to use the wings because it was kind of something that they didn't really want to do against Portland because they know the type of the type of defense Portland plays. So they really wanted to try to penetrate the box as much as they they could against the Timbers. And and for, to their advantage, it kind of worked out at the end with that with that equalizer and stoppage time. But I think for, for the game against Miami, I think a player like Brian Rodriguez has to be very active, contribute a lot, especially if Vela's not playing, because I think his his ability to go one on one, his ability to, to make things happen off the off the wing are very important. And I think whoever are the players that end up playing uh, the left back or the right back, the wing backs, they, they need to be very um, much so part of the offense as well. So whether or not Tiki Palacio starts or not, um, if he doesn't, it would probably be Ryan Hollingshead, who is, you know, a, a revered uh, defense defenseman in, 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 in MLS. So I think whoever does play those those positions, um, they need to also help push push forward as well and and kind of see a little bit of that dynamic where they could they could contribute to the offense, not so much just defensively and, and trying to keep a clean sheet or trying to make sure things are safe back there, but also push the game forward and contribute, whether it's passing. Because the thing about LAFC we know is the midfield is, is the motor and it always has been that way and, and the games will flow that way. So the one problem with that is that everybody already knows that. So I think that's why things got a little stale for Bob Bradley fast because when you try to move the game so much with three players in the midfield, things get a little complicated. And that's when you have to look out and see what players can can contribute and, and stretch the field. So I'm really looking for, for Brian Rodriguez to be a contributor for the defensive backs. And then if Vela doesn't play, then it would be uh, most likely Mahalo Poku on that right side. So that's th- those are the keys for me for them to, to kind of stretch that field to to contribute, uh, you know, either left side or the right side. Sounds like it might be a busy day for DeAndre Yedlin and Breck Shea. But, Andy, thank you so much for joining us to preview this thank game you, between man. LAFC and Inter Miami at Drive Pink Stadium on Saturday afternoon here in lovely Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Andy, where can people follow your work, be it on social media or on, uh, well, I guess Yahoo, uh, Yahoo's website? Yes, sir. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, enjoy the game for sure. I, I was I was talking to you guys. I was there for the Galaxy opener last year, and it's a fun time. I hope it I hope it's not too hot like it was that day because I was dying down there. But uh, <laughs> my writing, yeah, everything is on Yahoo. Uh, Yahoo. dot com. The soccer page, I you know cover the MLS as a whole, so you could check my stuff out there. And then on Twitter, it's just Andy underscore Diosa, my last name. You can find me there. I'll be tweeting. 
you know, about the game, about LAFC news, whatever, whatever comes to my mind and, and you know, everything else. So appreciate you guys for having me, man. No problem, brother. And that's D-E-O-S-S-A, D-O-S-A. By the way, before you go, I have to say this. I went to Barranquilla at the end of January and I saw Peru beat Colombia in Colombia. It was awesome time. Awesome time. <laughs> I was actually there myself. <laughs> Were you? Oh, nice. No, we should have, we should have, we should have met up, man. I mean, at least, at least beforehand. I won't say it was an awesome time, but I was <laughs> We should have met up beforehand, not afterwards. You probably were not in a good mood afterwards. I was not, I was not at all. <laughs> all right, Andy, thank you so much. And we will talk thank to you, you again thank very you. soon, okay? Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Okay, guys, it's Q&A time. By the way, let us know if you're enjoying these previews of, the, of uh, the opposing teams with experts on the opposing, on the opponent. <laughs> Just let us know what you think about it, if you like it, if it helps you provide uh, or helps you understand a little bit more context with the opponent, if you like it, if you prefer... We go back to the old way and just us dive into to the opponent and what we think needs to be done from an Inter-Miami perspective a bit more. Something we did not touch on in this last segment because, again, we were previewing LAFC and, and the matchup that team might bring is there was a complete, complete, complete stadium... I don't want to say debacle, but there were issues. There were a lot of issues for the season opener in terms of traffic getting in, in terms of parking, in terms of you know being able to walk into the stadium. I know Steve El Primo was was stuck in in traffic and was late uh, a little bit later than he expected to be because of how poor traffic was. I know Inter Miami was trying a lot of new things, but hopefully some of those have been sorted out for this weekend because yeah, that that the getting into the stadium and parked and everything was not a pleasant experience for a lot a lot of people and i know there were plenty of you out there uh, on social media and in other places expressing your frustration with regards to that but anyway i did want to touch on that ahead of this next home game but let's get to the q and a session and let's start with because we've got quite a few of them let's start with let me go through them talk Inner Miami CF is Phil in the hot seat after Sunday's result, or do you think he still has time, Jose? Uh, no, he still has time. I think we I think we set the deadline um, early in preseason. Remember when I asked uh, El Primo if um, if 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 my Inter Miami went winless in the first ten games? I think that was the deadline we said. <laughs> that would be the moment where Phil is in trouble, but. Um, and listen, they have tough opponents coming up, but I think they have two games within the first 10 that they can actually win. So, no, no, it's too early. No, I think it's fine. Okay. Steve, do you want to chime in there or do you want to go to the next question? Let's go to the next question. Okay. This one's from Christopher Corey, and I like this question. What faults does the club currently have that needs admitting for us to move forward? Steve. Forward with what? With what? To move forward in terms of being a better team? Look, I mean, you, you say that I make excuses and all this sort of stuff, but I, I, the sanctions clearly, looking at the longer term, they're clearly going to play their part in, in whatever happens in terms of the roster build and everything. It's going to have an effect for sure. It's not making an excuse, it's just the fact that, that it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to stunt, stunt their growth a bit for the, for the next year or year and a half or however long they have to deal with it. You know, the, the centre-backs would, you know, I've spoken to people around the club, you know, they like the guys like McVeigh, but they also know that he's the, one of probably the cheapest, you know, centre-backs around. They haven't spent money on the defence because they haven't had it really to do. So, I don't know. You know, it's difficult. It's, it's you know, they they have been working with, with restraints, but you've got to get on with it as they all will freely admit. Everyone's made mistakes. So, Yeah. I mean, there's no denying that the sanctions have played a part in the roster build and in how the season will unfold. Of course, you can't deny that. That's like you said, that's a fact. But I don't think that changes the the stated goal of them wanting to make the playoffs. Right? They still want to be a competitive yeah. team. They still want to to try to and go they out should there. Do. They right. should do. Because so they, then that's know, not that's not an excuse then. That's not an excuse. Year, they would have done it. Then it's not an excuse then. Then just just no, because, just because you have sanctions just... does not mean. You you know you, you can't 
uh, have an ambition to be a playoff team, and that means that you should be getting blown no, out five to no, one. No, but you know, I think it will be a very up and down season probably, and they'll probably just have to sneak in. It won't be emphatic, I don't think. Well, are they going to be at the top of the table, ten points clear? You know, after 10, 15 games? No, probably not. Okay, next question, and it comes from Via, and I will let you guys respond to this in however way, shape, or form you want to. Probably starting with Steve because this is his wheelhouse. Via asked this before the news update, which Steve can get into. What is the team, Jorge Mas, and Bex's confidence level going into Thursday's Freedom Park vote? Has any news organization taken a commissioner poll on how they are leaning in the past two weeks? Steve, update us on the stadium, por favor. No, that's it. There, there, there is no real update. The uh, the hearing for the lease of the land for Mel, Mel Reese Country Club, you know, the golf, golf club near the airport, um, it's been put back at least another two or three weeks, I think, until next month. So, um yeah, there's there's not. They've always been confident it's going to happen. It's just when it will happen. If it happens now, or happens in fifty years' time, are they confident it's going to happen? Yes. So, uh, no, we have to wait and see. But no update really. Two more. We'll do two more. There's a bunch, but we can't get to all of them. Um, so two more. The next one comes from Doe Snows. Please explain how Lewis Morgan has gotten so much better in New York, scoring hat tricks, and in Miami, Phil had him playing defense. Do we still trust in Phil as a player development or tactical? Coach. So, like I said, there are questions about Phil Neville after this loss, which is normal because it was a very big blowout defeat. Now, as for Lewis Morgan, he scored a hat trick, a first half hat trick, very video game esque. No, we're not talking about football manager guys, but very video game esque of him to score a hat trick for the New York Red Bulls against Toronto FC this past weekend. He was voted the MLS Player of the Week as a result. You know, hats off to Lewis Morgan. Kudos to him for for having a great performance. I believe it was his first career hat trick. So, look. Lewis Morgan is playing in a team that better plays to his strengths. Uh, you know, we saw that Lewis Morgan in his first season was was at his best when he had space to run and he could attack, whip in some crosses, and get get on the end of things as well on occasion. And in this game against Toronto FC, which I watched, he did a lot of that, a lot of running in uh, into spaces and and getting on the end of things and carrying the ball forward. So you know, he he was at his best. He was thriving against a Toronto FC team that that continued to press high and leave a lot of space in behind. So, you know, he played well. He made the most of that game. And to to your point, yes. And again, goes back to the point I made very early, or not very early, but in the first segment about one criticism that I have of Phil Neville is that he tinkers a little bit too much for my personal taste. That's just my analysis. Jose maybe doesn't share it. Steve maybe doesn't share it. Maybe some of you listeners out there don't share it. But I think he experiments a little bit too much. And, you know, Lewis Morgan, this is one game for him in, in, in New York. So you can't just say all of a sudden he is this goal-scoring machine. But obviously last season he was played out of position. And that really, really hindered him. Which is, I believe, Jose, we, we agreed on and we touched on at different points last year when, when we just had uh, talks off the mic about, about the state of the team. So... Yes. Yeah. Yes, I do think that 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 Phil Neville has to has to find a way to play players to their strengths, and I think Lewis Morgan is chief among the examples of, of one player that he did not. No, to that point, I want to say that you know it, it's different when you play when you when you switch positions between center backs. It's completely different than Lewis Morgan, for example, what we saw last year. And the one question that I have is Robert Taylor. What is what is the position that Robert Taylor will play in a five three two formation? Left. That's something that left center mid. Um, obviously, he'll play in the middle. Yes, obviously, he'll play in the middle. But you know, will that be uh, an ideal role for him, an ideal position for him, or are we close to watching Lewis Morgan two point That is the question. So hey, he looked good at left just, center mid on 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 Sunday, but again. Context was the game was 3-0 in favor of Austin FC. Right, so. right, right, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, last question, and again, we can all tackle it, or one of us, whoever, comes from Atlante Herons. After attending the game Sunday, it's shocking how far behind this club is compared to recent expansion teams. Not just on-field success, but fan engagement, stadium experience, food, parking. Rank the rollouts, Inter-Miami, Nashville, Austin, Cincinnati, Atlanta, Minnesota, LAFC, and Charlotte. So that's a loaded question, and actually we will hold on to it for now because we'll be here for a long time if, if we answer that right now. So um, 
Let's go to Don Cavicito, you know, so we get a, a proper last question. Is it too early to press the panic button? Steve. Yes. 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 Of course it is. Of course it. Yes. No, no okay. panic button. No. It is early. Although, although Frank early. already pushed it. I didn't push it. it. I didn't push it. I did not push it. I would say it's too early to press the panic button, but keep an eye on it. Keep an eye on it. Because... Oh, come on. It's too early. Ten games. Ten games. Give him ten games. And, and we'll see what happens in 10 games. I just said keep an eye on it. I didn't say press it. Just keep an eye on it. Keep an eye but on you it. do want to press it. I, I can feel <laughs> it. Um, I, I think I want to play football manager. How about that? How about that? Maybe that's music to your ears. Um, okay, that does, it, that does it for the Q&A session for this week's show. If we didn't get to yours, submit a question again next week. And we will, obviously, with the questions, the amount of questions we get, we can't get to every single one. Otherwise, this podcast will be two hours long plus so let's wrap up the show let's give our final thoughts again it can be on anything you guys want anything doesn't have to be on inter miami could be about your personal life could be about a movie uh, i saw batman actually the new batman movie earlier this week so it can be about anything you want i think jose is going to talk about miami fc though but anyway let's start with drum roll jose yeah i'll, I'll no well honestly no <laughs> i want to I wanted to talk about um, the USL Championship getting started over the weekend. Very excited. Um, you know, there's a lot of soccer to watch. And thankfully, you know, I have all the subscriptions that are needed. Um, I will be calling one of the games. So if people want to tune out, I'll be calling Charleston Battery on Saturday night. Um, so hopefully people tune in. They'll be, oh, well, listen, I'm, I'm doing the Tulsa feed. So. Yeah, you may be maybe a little bit to to watch it on on ESPN Plus, but yeah, just you know, excited about more soccer coming in on over the weekend. Uh, of course, following Miami FC as well, and nice uniforms. It was a great event over the weekend. Was it the weekend on Friday? Yeah, it's on Friday. Friday. Yeah. Had a lot of fun with Franco there and everybody that attended. So yeah, just excited about the USA Championship get, getting going and and trying to watch some more soccer and you know with great anticipation before my favorite tournament which starts late this month as well the u.s open cup so yeah that, that's that's my final thought go watch some uso championship as well steve well if you've got an idea of how hard management can be you're going to go look at Maurizio pochettino tonight but just now you know the paris Saint Germain <laughs> had a front three of lionel messi neymar and mbappe now that is pure football manager stuff going on right there uh, two up and aggregate and lost three 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 one on the night three two and aggregate and it's probably going to get the sack and then end up end up at Man United, um, so there you go. So um, that's going to be an interesting story to watch over the uh, next few months. So I have two final thoughts. Actually, might be three. Quick one is on. Let's see what Inter Miami does with Noah Allen. He obviously has played in his two MLS games on loan based on all the MLS rules. So let's see what the team does ahead of this weekend's game. Do they sign him? Uh, to an MLS deal that's the only way he'd be able to play in another MLS game this year you know let's keep an eye out and see what happens see what happens there the second one I will quickly say is on Miami FC which invited us out to their event uh, on Friday night and I do like their jerseys I do like their jerseys I like the if you haven't seen them make sure you check them out on Google or on our Twitter Twitter handles Uh, I do like the away jersey a bit more than the home jersey the the home jersey is like an aqua-ish um, with some like wave pattern across the chest it looks nice um, on the back it has a bunch of different miami cities embedded into the back of the jersey uh the names of the cities but the away jersey is a navy uh blue or is it navy blue yeah or royal blue royal blue navy bluish and it has the miami skyline embedded into the chest area and a bunch of different Miami cities, or maybe all the Miami cities or towns uh, embedded into the jersey as well, the names. So my, 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 third, my third and final thought will be on how we started the show. And that's on Phil Neville. And look, I'm critical of Phil Neville because I think that there are areas that he can improve. Just like I see in the team, there are areas to improve. I will also point out where I think Phil Neville can improve, and that's just my opinion from the outside. Doesn't mean I'm right, doesn't mean I'm wrong, it's just my opinion. And again, on the human side, there is part of me that does sympathize with him and does feel bad for him to an extent, but that does not take away from doing the job of being a media member and being unbiased and impartial, and I have to call it like I see it, so... That, that's all I can say. Uh, actually, I'm going to sneak a fourth one in because I have to explain myself here. Jose. Jose. I call Island. I call Jose Island Jose because his wife, 
we were joking one day after practice and we got into like ribbing him for for his opinions because sometimes Jose has some really wild opinions that like you know he doesn't share them too much here he he kind of keeps he plays a little safer here on Miami Total Football Radio but when he's just you know shooting the crap um, for for lack of a better phrase when we're just talking we're just bantering about he and he honestly says a little bit more and he lets himself go a little bit and he gets a little loose there um, you know he has some wild opinions that we don't always share so we started to call him Island Jose. Um, playfully, which I maybe may re- have replaced Cinco. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. But uh, he wore an island shirt on Friday night, which was very, very fitting. Definitely gave him some some stick for that. But anyway, that does it for this week's show. Thank you guys again so much for listening. If you haven't already, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We're closing in on our magic number. So if you can get, give us a review, if you haven't already, please, please do so. Also, give us a follow on all our social media channels. We will be back again next week to review the game against LAFC. Hopefully, it's a much better performance and result from from what we saw this past weekend. So we will do that again, hopefully early next week, but we'll see how things play out. For Steve El Primo Brenner, for Jose Cinco slash Island Jose, Armando, I am Franco Penizo. This is Miami Total Football Radio, and we'll talk to you guys again soon.